leaving the area, obviously, before I get to L.A. I look at him, he's up there, like, maybe where that black Volvo is, and he's leaned way over. And I'm like, God, look how far he's leaning over, he's leaning. <laughs> and then after a while, I'm thinking, maybe I'm leaned over like that, too. Fuck. I didn't think about it. At first, I was like, look at him go. Fuck, look how, look at him. You know, meanwhile, I'm way over here, of course, you know. It was kind of funny when I realized that. And at first, uh, I really was, you know, very anxious, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, moderately terrified. To be a little more accurate. I started recording this uh, a while back. I never finished it. And now I, I, it turned out that there's this uh, contest for a website called motovlog.com, which is dedicated to motorcycle chatterboxes like me, riding around, talking to themselves, and under the delusion that other people might think it's interesting. But if you go by my channel numbers, it's pretty clear that not everyone's interested. <laughs> People aren't really interested in mine. Uh, last year, in 2015, May of 2015, I went on this camping trip with the motorcycle. I went with a club that uh, supports the type of bike I have. I guess I'll tell the story here. This, this, a few days before this uh, event, before this camping trip, it, I, yeah, I think it was within a week. For some reason, my mom and I are talking about um, this old plane trip that her and I and my father all took back in the 70s, 1970s. And I was just a little kid. I was probably, I don't know, near, give or take around 10, 10 years old, I'll say. It's an old story about our family taking a trip a, where we had to fly. One of the little planes we were in, as we're flying along, we ended up getting in some kind of a horrible turbulence. And my mom kept saying, oh, it was horrible. You know, I was scared. And she says, I look at daddy, you know, my dad, and he's white, <laughs> whiter than normal, you know. And the thing about that, what's funny about that is that he worked in the uh, aerospace industry, you know. So he knew all about planes and he knew how these things were put together. So when he's worried, <laughs> you know, when you see someone who knows how they're built worrying about it, it gives you a moment of concern, which is exactly what happened to her. The plane is, is bouncing up and down. It's uh, a lot of turbulence, you know, this kind of really violent bullshit. The, the air, is, the wind is just bitch slapping the plane left and right. And he, she's like, I'm there scared and, and worried, and you know, daddy's there scared and worried. And then she says to me, I, I don't know what was wrong with you. But, and I didn't want to say anything, because you were laughing and carrying on, having a great old time. Everyone else was scared out of their minds. Uh, and I guess I was just too young and stupid, and you know, I wasn't really worried about it. <laughs> so, as I, now I go to this camping trip, I'm on my way back. Sequoia National Forest is where we were. Unfortunately, by then, all my batteries had died and all that. There wasn't going to be any footage of this. And I was kind of too unfamiliar with what I'm going to do at all, let alone trying to organize a photo shoot, you know. And he was like, I just want to get home. You know, it's Sunday night, i got to work tomorrow. Um, it wasn't night, it was Sunday. We're, we're going to get, trying to get home before dark, you know. Um, and it's going to take all day to get there, to get home. So we, we're setting up real quick and I pack up everything and I get on the bike and we go through this long convoluted path through the mountainside, through the canyon or the mountains and the forest and it's beautiful. Take a few still shots here and there, uh, but mostly we keep it moving. Heading back to Los Angeles on the 14th. This is not the 14th. This, my friends, is what is traditionally called a reenactment. So I'm behind him. That guy actually right there. We're on a different ride now. And we're on the 14th. And we're 
We were just about to get onto the 14, actually. I've been following him through the mountains all weekend, blah, 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 with me and the group. We've been doing different things, going different rides. And it's all good. And the 14 is across the Mojave Desert. There's nothing there. Literally nothing. It's like you're riding on, on Mars. Absolutely nothing there. It's completely flat. And see, he's an older, more experienced rider, so he likes to floor it. He knows how to ride. He's doing, I'm doing 90 now just to keep up with him. I mean, I, I think my speedometer is broken, actually. It's, that's not really true. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, we're, on, we're on the freeway. He wants me to pass him, actually. There he goes. And as soon as we get on the freeway, I mean on this highway, just before we get on, actually, we're just about to get on, we're two big semis roar by. You know, roar by. They're on their way to LA as well. No big deal. He says, yeah, it's kind of windy. And, you know, that's not going to make it any easier. He says something like that. <laughs> and I'm like completely oblivious. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I kind of figured it myself. Uh, but, you know, probably won't make it easier. Headwind or whatever, you know. I really have no idea what he's talking about. And when I first started out, like within the first three or four minutes, we had to pass two semis once we turned onto the highway. They had just passed, you know. So, of course, we caught up with them quick. But as you approach them, you can see them kind of doing this. The wind pushes them over left and right. And so they're kind of in their lane, but they're also weaving up close to the line and back again. So this is insane. But he did it. And I, that's the only thing I really kept going, kept me going at first, watching him do it. He just barreled right on through. His bike would also, you know, once you pass the truck, now you're in the wind, and so then suddenly he's being pushed out, and he counters back, and then he's back on mine. And I just kept thinking, well, he's doing it. You know, what am I crying about if he can do it? I, I get in there, and I, and I somehow manage to do the same thing. You know, the wind stops pushing me, I start to drift towards this wall of metal, moving at 80 miles an hour. I'm moving slightly faster. I correct the bike. <clears throat> I'm, my, I'm basically thinking, don't look at it. <laughs> That's the only way I can keep from being so fucking scared that I just plow right into it. You know, lock up completely on uh, target fixation type of thing and just ram it. That's, that's basically what I feel like I'm about to do. So I'm kind of like, don't look at it. Don't look at it. So I don't. I, I just see the peripherally, but I'm focused more on him. He's ahead of me. And the road. And just getting past, past the truck. Then there's another truck right after that one. Because there was two. So that one's not any easier. I'm hanging on for dear life. And the wind's blowing all over the place. So I'm constantly trying to correct for the wind. Pushing the bike left, right. You know, too far, too little. I'm leaning too much. I'm not leaning enough. Uh, the truck blocks it part way, so the wind is, is off again, now it's back on again. Uh, it, it's just, like, very, very, you know, hectic, to say the least. And it's ever so slightly fucking terrifying. That's, that's the more honest version of it. So, somehow, in the middle, and then I keep on going. We pass those two trucks, and that was right away after we get on the highway. And then there's nothing for a while. And maybe there's other cars, but that's not nearly as frightening as these huge semis. Because the semis literally like, when you ride up past them, it's literally like you're riding next to a wall. You know, the, the lane's not much wider than this, and this thing just goes straight up. And it's all metal. And it's all weaving. And the whole thing is moving, including you, at about 80 miles an hour. And there's nothing around you. But, what happened after that is where, it actually, to me, it actually gets interesting. In that, the, as I'm riding along and I pass another few cars, and that's hairy, but even when I'm not passing cars, I'm still leaning into the wind, and the bike is sort of doing this, you know, shaky thing, feeling like every bump I feel and all that, and uh, the wind is pushing and not, but not steady enough to, to be stable. It just feels, everything feels weird and it's way too fast 
I, I, I felt like at first, um, you know what, I'm just going to pull over, curl up in a little ball and cry. That's kind of how it felt. Like, this is ridiculous. This is fucking insane. That's how it feels. That's how it, what it feels like you want to say. You just want to say, fuck this. Absolutely fuck this bullshit. This is fucking insane with the wind like that. And that's how it was for a while. So what can I do about this? I can't drive home for the next three to four hours just fucking enraged because, you know, I'm scared, basically. I hate admitting it, but that's basically what was the situation. I didn't know what to do. And it was fucking frightening. But I had to get through it. So I was still riding. I didn't give up. I didn't pull over and cry. But it certainly wasn't, uh, you know, this wasn't the way to handle it. There's no way, I'm gonna go away on a cross-country trip and just be angry the whole way. <laughs> For a week or two. I mean, it's absurd. So, there's got to be some other version of this. I don't know. I, I wasn't really expecting it, per se, like it wasn't a plan. I, I just started thinking, I got to channel that and download that uh, old uh, personality that I had of, of not being afraid. Maybe I was just too stupid to be afraid, but <laughs> I still wasn't afraid. I was laughing. And combine it with you know, challenge and meet the fear with love. So I just started thinking, yeah, it's not scary, it's fun. It's like a fun roller coaster ride. So then every time the wind would hit me and I'd feel the bike suddenly going, oh, I just started saying love. Love it, love, love it, love, love, love. Love, 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 love it, love. I'm just yelling love in my helmet the whole way. That kind of thing. Trying to change my attitude and you know force counter steer that fucking attitude online and get myself thinking positive and it's fun it's okay it's all good you know and god damn it if it didn't really actually start to work I started feeling a lot less terrified I was able to go a lot faster and keep up with my friend and suddenly it started to become less and less. Like the only thing I could, I couldn't change the bike. It was pretty much as good as it's gonna get. I couldn't pull over and cry. That wasn't gonna help. Swearing didn't help. The only thing I could do was change my attitude. So that's essentially what I did. And after about maybe 20 minutes, 45 minutes of that, I stopped saying stuff like that, you know, like directly when a wind gust would hit me, ha ha, you know, we, I stopped doing that, I just stopped doing anything, I was just like, oh, okay, it's another one, and I wasn't worried anymore, somehow, the, the, the fear evaporated, and it was just kind of, I became the new normal after a while, because, you know, when you're doing it for two or three hours in a row, eventually it's not new, <laughs> it's eventually, it's just the way it is, um, but I'm trying to share that luckily my mom told me that story so it was fresh in my mind and so then when I had this experience on the you know the following Sunday on the way home I actually drew that on drew that pulled that up out of the files uh, and downloaded that and suddenly I was able to cope with it fear is a forward better word but so is love and it, love is actually stronger Love is something. Love is a positive, proactive thing. Fear is just the absence of love. It's like a shadow. So one of the things about the thing, the, the wind is also, don't grip so tight. Stay loose. Keep the, the, the really what you should do is put it on your leg. But I, what I was doing is holding it open like this, so that when I felt those gusts hit me, the bike starts to correct on its own. If you give it a chance. If you're hanging on to it like this, really tight in a death grip, the bike. Can't, you're fighting the, the bike's fighting you as well as as the wind or whatever the bumps are. But if you're if you leave your for me, I was leaving my hand over, and by the time I start to grab it, the bike's already sort of corrected itself, and I felt like that made a big difference. In the future, I would probably hold it even looser, or like this, open, but not grabbing the handlebar. You know, just resting my arms and maybe my back or whatever. Uh, for that's fine. Let the bike do its thing. These are two giant gyroscopes you're on, and they don't want to twist. They don't want to tip over. 
they want to stay where they wherever they're set once you lean into it and it's set like this it's, it doesn't want to do this and it doesn't want to do that it wants to stay there which is a good thing that's what we want too <laughs> I want something predictable and stable so that was kind of my story about how, do, how I rode to the Mojave Desert through uh, gusty winds from the first time <laughs> I saw my own shadow. I was like, who's that? <laughs> right next to me. <laughs> That's hilarious.